you for? <laughs> Um, okay, so um, yeah, so I want to talk about multi uh, languages that support uh, multiple paradigms, right? So what I really mean by that is uh, ones that support object orientated in FP. And there's two reasons that I'm coming at that. I, I quite like Python as a language, and I find it really interesting how in Python, which is one community, they split between the two styles. So the the web programming side is entirely OO, and the scripting and scientific side is much more FP. And also, I'm working at The Guardian, and we're in this process of like, where we've been using Scala, and we're making this big effort to move to an entirely FP style. Right? So I think languages that are multi-paradigm support these two things, Python, Groovy, Scala, things that aren't like that, uh, Java and Ruby, while they have lambdas. I think those lambdas generally just occupy a space in an iterator to provide uh, like a more convenient um, syntax sugar over anonymous class iterators. Um, so how many of you guys actually use a multi-paradigm language? OK. Yeah? OK. So um, or who feels, let, let's ask it another way. So I, I have some observation about multi-paradigm languages. If I, if I make them, will they make sense? Or do you want to be talked about, talked through like what some of the disadvantages are as you come in? What's your view? Yes. Yeah. OK, so, so I think ones that constructively allow an object-orientated style and an FP have in, inside them a tension inherent, right? And that's because there's, there's the illusion that the two styles are compatible when they're actually not. When you have higher order functions, you're making expectations of the code that you're interoperating with that are not compatible with the assumptions you're working under OO. And I'll, I'll take a very simple example, which is uh, data encapsulation. Right? Data encapsulation in OO is about saying the object is the base unit and encapsulates both behavior and state and also transition from one state to another. Uh, that means that when FP code, which is based on higher order type functions, is trying to say something about OO code. Um, the, the, the ideas about referential transparency and repeatability and substitution, all those things kind of fall down when they interact with objects. So the natural tension is that the FP side of the language is trying to downgrade objects into more or less immutable tuples of state that are created and shared easily. And object orientation is still trying to seize like packages of functions and bind them into themselves and hide stuff away. And I, I think the simplest expression of this tension is like exceptions. Uh, exception throwing in object orientation is like a really sensible thing, right? Because an exception is something you can propagate out of an object without revealing anything about the interior of the object. It's uh, completely, you can only, you only expose what you want to expose. When a higher order function tries to deal with an operation that may throw multiple exceptions, then you either get a terrible compromise which is like the groovy style of thing where it's like it's a runtime exceptions and just stuff might happen, right? Or you either try and encode it in the type, or you, where Scala is really going is like the either. I think that's fair to say where we're going in the Guardian is probably trying to encode errors specifically in types and then use either uh, to return either an error condition or the correct operation of it. So I think that's, that's my view. Is, is, is that I don't think we can have multiple paradigm languages work because this tension exists in all of them, and it's, uh, you can't reconcile it. I think there's like a lot of plastering over the, the problems that having these two styles are in, and it's, it's difficult for technical leadership, right? If you're the leader on a team of multiple paradigm, we kind of had it in the previous talk, where people were talking about, like, well, you need to establish good practice in Scala, for example. But that means that a Scala tech lead needs to really deeply understand OO and like what it's trying to achieve and how you best work with it, but also how uh, functional programming works and how higher order functions abstract details away and what the best, uh, you know, what the best practice is for creating genuinely combinable functions and libraries. And it's this terrible kind of cognitive burden on the leadership to come up with rules. And if, uh, if they choose rules that span both, then everyone in the team has to understand all the possible combinations of good practice for both languages that might exist in the code base. And you have to write both styles of code to be aware of the others. You've got to write your functional code to go like, well, I could have a side effect here. You know? And in the object orientation, it's like, 
well, I might be you know, copied and I've got to be careful about you know, you know, throwing unchecked exceptions and things like that. And I think the flow is really only going one way, right? For various reasons, kind of concurrency, uh, comprehension, abstraction, modularity, reusability of code. I think the general trend in programming is away from OO and towards functional programming. And therefore, it feels like the multi-paradigm language doesn't really have uh, a, a, a bright future, right? It, it almost exists as a bridge to move us to functional programming. Um, except for there's some counterexamples like the Python one, where it's like within the community, maybe you have a consistent set of rules, but then, you know, I think even even that's shifting because like Django starts to introduce decorators and you start you know you start to move towards this functional programming and that's where the momentum is. So that's the way I feel about it. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but Right. So because that, actually, that makes everything easier, whether you're what, whatever you're doing, whether mm. it's a straight current procedural thing or whether you're or whatever it is. But there are tensions against that for example, because if the, if all your operations return a copy of something, then there there are points at which you don't want to be copying, you know, your entire database mm. to do some transformation on it. And so there there are there are other there are other tensions, aren't there? But yeah. Just your expression of it. If, if you know. <laughs> so I think immutability is an interesting one because it's one that spreads, right? I'll, I'll let, sorry, I'll let you come in, but it's. Composability mm. and all that other stuff. Yeah. It's immutability or continuous or whatever yeah. you call it. That's a really important thing. And that's, that's one of the things that makes Haskell really interesting. Mm. You have the, the immutable bit of programming and then the bit where Simon Payton Jones mm. waves his arm and says, <laughs> oh, the missile. Yeah. Because without. So I, th I think what's interesting is the immutability over time, time series coming into it. So, uh, you know, we started to talk about uh, immutable servers, about immutable data streams, uh, and the idea that projections come out of these immutable things, um, which is, and so I think immutability spreads, but sorry, Nick, you were going to say something. Um, I was going to say, so, if you are concerned about immutability, then the language really does sort of decide that a lot in terms of if you're doing a kind of mixed language where maybe the functional side is more by convention, so if you're doing Java but you're mm -hmm. just trying to not change stuff or whatever, then that doesn't give you as much freedom because it is expensive to copy stuff like you're using like code or maybe the mutable functions in Scala or whatever, then the language supports that because it's here oh, sure. supports that. So then, so sure, I'm not, I'm not, not, I'm not saying that's it, that it's not a, a relevant thing because the, yeah. the, um, the notation you have or the syntax you have and, and the performance is like completely you know, different. If, if Lisp was, was yeah. actually clear, we'd all be writing Lisp. <laughs> but when, when you, Which we may be doing, right? <laughs> if we take that, that string example that Dick had, hmm. had up earlier, you say, well, I've got a Lisp, and now it's a stream, and I'm doing this reduce, and, and you read it in order, and that's the order that things happen. Hmm. Right? And if you wrote that in Lisp, it would, it would all be inside out. Well, but but you can use you can use a macro to to organize the order of things. But I think the key thing in either language is that the, that you're composing the elements into the you know in what closure terms is a semantic pipeline, right? So you're you're passing data through functions, but there's got to be certain guarantees that the outcome of each step in the function has rules. I think there's also something. I mean, I want to come back to immutability a little bit and OO programming. Like, I think it's absolutely in the paradigm of OO programming that an object can mutate itself, right? Because it's encapsulated, it's, it's isolated away. And I think there's an interesting implication when you introduce immutability into OO programming, because you basically say it's not okay to mutate your own state in accordance to the signals and the messages you're receiving from outside the object. And I think what happens is that you switch to FP style by stealth, rather than making a conscious decision to say, this is where I want to go. I wasn't here for the previous talk, but oh, yeah, I, I, I'm imagining. Yeah. 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 Where does that list come from? And maybe that's that's that can that's your kind of abstract data type. You know, like that could be a list which is made for testing purposes. Mm. That's just a list. Yeah. It's from a database or it's yeah. That's your that's your kind of 
the object orientated bit because you're not concerned about where that's come from necessarily. Mm. Mm. The functional part is, is what you is your transformation, isn't it? The, the, the yeah, okay. Yeah, so so I mean I guess I guess the example that I was thinking of for this talk was like an implementation of the visitor pattern. Mm -hmm. Whereas like visitor pattern in OO, it's a whole pattern, there's a book written about it, and it's like a zip map or something in, in a kind of functional thing, and do you actually separate the two parts? You have a transformer, which is encapsulating the behavior, and you have a traversable, which is en encapsulating state. And the transformer generates new instances, so there's a separation between the input and output, but always the same outcome. I think like, this is all real detail level, but I think like, the point of your, uh, you know, the whole point of the, this talk, I wholeheartedly agree with, where as a tech leader, you kind of want to maintain consistency in your Mm. Just on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you can have different styles sneaking in, and then you've got different problems with the other styles. And, and I think it's a really difficult conversation to have with your developers about it, right? Because they're coming from a really honest place where it's like, but this is good practice in the paradigm that I'm using. And you're going, right, but because these other guys are working in this paradigm, I need you to change to like have this mid so that we can interoperate between the two styles of code, you know? Mm. You, you know, someone likes a certain library, right? Yeah. And that has a certain style associated with it. Yeah. And then that may be in, uh, at ends with the way you're doing your work day to day. Yeah. So you actually have to change your mind again, and then you've got this bleed where the library works in a certain way, yeah. but the rest of your code works in yeah. a different way. And this is the real problem with the next generation of functional languages that are built on the JVM. They all say, we do Java interop, yeah. which then inherently invalidates their claims to immutability, like concurrency, all these things. And, uh, and therefore, you're saying, well, how far, f you know, how much further forward are you? You know, it kind of feels like um, that, that if you can't make guarantees about things, and it's kind of, it's interesting to compare Scala and Clojure here, because Clojure makes guarantees for its language. But because Scala does allow you to mix mutable and immutable uh, concepts, then you might have a Scala native library for something which is using a paradigm that you don't personally use with. So someone naively drops in um, you know, a library, you take the result of it, and you do something really simple like reduce it or something, and, and actually you're invoking side effects, so you have a non-repeatable reduce, and you get this really inconsistent behavior in production, right? which is really hard to figure out. Um, and that feels, that feels really problematic. It's OK to like bridge people across, but it doesn't feel like a sustainable you know, platform and, and future for it. And I wondered about that when I was talking about when I was thinking about this talk and about what I wanted to talk about. And the fact is that our compilers are not sophisticated enough to guarantee rules, and our code introspection tools aren't good enough to guarantee code. And therefore, when we say we have strict rules for a team, we have no real way of enforcing them. We have no way of enforcing that someone doesn't throw an exception unless it's literally grepping through and like, does, is there a throw statement anywhere here? OK, well, let's hope that no library that they've brought in <laughs> throws something. Or, or you know, maybe every library has to have its source, and it all has to be subject to static analysis. But you know, that's exceptions. But you know, what if someone you know, does mutate something you know, you, you get some support in Scala with vowels and vars, you know, um, but there are still situations where uh, you can have a vowel to a reference that is itself mutable, and it might be. Ver I don't think the compiler can really detect that. You can have code rules about the conventions in the core of the language, but when someone has implemented a type, guaranteeing that that is not mutable itself, it, I think it's very hard. So, so you can have conventions, but they're not enforceable. And it, uh, you know, like mistakes happen all the time, right? Despite our best intentions, like we've all got bugs. Um, and 
the effect might be quite subtle. It might be very difficult to differentiate, you know, like to separate out, you know, like, like that reducing side effects. Where, where, you know, like it's even worse with parallel execution, right? You've got a side effect that occurs sometimes, um, but when it occurs is in, you know, almost entirely variable. Uh, okay, so I guess I've overrun my talk because people are kind of here. But thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>